Though no man, no matter how great, can know his destiny, some lives have been foretold, Merlin. Welcome to Myths and Magic, a fancast about BBC's Merlin. I'm Edith. And I'm Naomi. And this is episode four. <laughs> I'm afraid at this point someone's going to make a compilation of me saying I'm excited, but I'm really excited for this one. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sure someone's out there making compilations of me saying definitely every single time, or exactly. I say that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I know that's when I edit. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, but still. Yeah, that's the worst thing about hearing yourself recorded is that you find out your own like little quirks and then you can annoy yourself by knowing that about yourself. Exactly. And I do see, look at that. Wow, exactly yet again. <laughs> but I do run <laughs> through the recordings at least two times, usually three times, which if you think about it, it's like an hour to an hour and a half long. And so I just get to hear that over and over again. <laughs> but you know. It's fine. Well, here we are, back on our usual grind. <laughs> How's your week I love been? It for us? Uh, my week, I have to remember what I even did. It's been pretty chill this week. Well, relatively chill. We had some, I guess, health situations, like family-wise going on, and so I had to cancel a lot of my plans. But, you know, canceled plans aren't always the worst. <laughs> Sometimes I love canceled plans. Sometimes cancelling plans is the best plan. <laughs> it is. I cancelled plans for tomorrow too, and honestly, I feel so free now. It's really nice. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. How about to... your week? I mean, I'm still in a bit of a move situation. It's very complicated, but I'm officially, like, I guess officially, on Monday, I have officially moved. Is the situation I'm in right now, but at like the time of recording this I'm kind of living in two places and it's a bit of a mess <laughs> are you living still between your new and old flat because you don't have wi-fi yet or I mean I, I do not have wi-fi at my new place which is why I'm now at my old place recording this with you um but all of my stuff is in the new place uh, but my roommate is still living in the old place and she just got home from spending the summer with her parents. So I kind of want to hang out with her. So it's like, I don't know, I'm kind of living in two places. And sometimes it's a bit like when I want specific things and they're 40 minutes away. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's annoying. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's I mean, it's going to end soon. I'm getting sorted out, I guess. <laughs> Well, I hope that you do get everything sorted out and that that works out for you. I need to get on doing stuff for next semester in uni um, that I've been ignoring. But, you know, we'll get there. Yeah, I'm so excited to start uni again. And, you know, I never thought I would say this, but I miss doing work. <laughs> well, I can't relate right now. I have uni in... I start uni in November, like the 3rd of November or something. But I have to, because I'm changing majors, apply to change majors by the 20th. And I'm going to Switzerland next Wednesday, so I need to do that before then. And I have everything ready to go, actually. I literally just have to <laughs> switch, like, one tab and send in the application. And yet, here we are. Yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds complicated. It always confuses me so much that, like, every country has their own system. So whenever someone... Because, like, I study in Sweden, obviously. And whenever someone's like, yeah, my semester starts in November, I'm like, What? <laughs> why honestly it's mostly just germany a lot i think most other countries match up i'm not sure which ones are like us because even switzerland doesn't match up with us yeah but like so. I, we have a mutual friend who lives in england uh and she was like yeah my vacation starts in like late july and i'm like what that's so late <laughs> I didn't even pay attention to that that evie's vacation like starts that late <laughs> Oh, well. I don't know. It's it, it confuses me a lot. Me and my friend watched Skins this summer. I I would not recommend it, but we did. Uh, and I was so confused through the entire show about like the English school system because I'm just like, what is this? 
<laughs> is this high school? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, school systems in every country are just so, so different, so varying. Yeah. Okay, l- let's try to talk about Merlin, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, how about we not talk about uni? Um, I'm sure people are trying to forget about uni, whether it's soon or they're still doing, um, what's it called in English? Like, you know, homework in between semesters, whatever. Uh, Yeah, we would like to thank you guys again before we get into our topic again, our, our, our topic today, for your support and your very, very sweet messages to us. We really received some really sweet messages these last two weeks, and we're so very appreciative of that yeah i mean you guys are so lovely and every time i see a new message i'm like oh (laughs) i'm so glad that you're listening and that you appreciate this because i thought we would have like five people who cared so it's nice to know that there are people out there who are like this is nice (laughs) i appreciate you for what you're doing it really is fun and it's really motivating to know other people are listening too And we have, so we asked you guys for comments and questions, especially on this episode. And so if you submitted one of those comments and questions, unless I missed it, unfortunately, most likely they're scattered through this episode um, in accordance to whatever part they fit into. And you'll probably hear your question come up somewhere in there. Yeah. Yep. And if you (laughs) manage to listen until the end, you will find out what our next podcast episode or podcast will be about because we already know the topic for next in the, the next two weeks i guess yeah we decided already but we're gonna save it as a treat for people who listen to the end <laughs> exactly um i guess let's go ahead today we are talking about the wonderful morgana pendragon yay <laughs> The, the yay as if Edith is really about to go off on this episode. I feel it. Oh, I'm going to try to stay calm. I think that's my my challenge this week, is not to get too worked up about this. <laughs> We're going to have a cool discussion. We're going to keep it chill. <laughs> you can lie to yourself all that you want. It's all right. Yeah. Well, anyway, Morgana. What do what do you think about her? <laughs> How would you describe I'm, Morgana as a person? Let's say at I the think, start of the show. At the start. I think at the start I would say she she's someone that we see immediately already has this very strong moral compass. She's already so defiant and it's really evident that she's disagreed with Uther's stance on things for years because, I mean, in the first episode, she already tells Uther that he's going to create enemies for himself if he keeps doing stuff like this. So I think she's very strong in her opinions, very defiant, um, very kind, however. She really cares about others uh, and very. she can also be very sympathetic. And that's kind of the vibe I got from her, especially in the first two seasons. I think at the beginning... Maybe she hasn't realized just how bad of a person Uther really is. And she still has some, I guess, loyalty to him. Because he is, even though she doesn't know the truth, he is still her father figure. I think that's definitely true. She, I mean, we see throughout the first half of the series moments where she either could have been the downfall of Uther or where she could have gone against Uther and then she doesn't because she's still torn between her her love for Uther despite everything that he's done and everything that he is and what she thinks to be right. Yeah. And I think we definitely in season 1 we do see her dislike of Uther uh growing throughout the episodes. Um and it doesn't really like it of course she doesn't actually go through with killing him this early <laughs> uh but she has the thought earlier than i realized when i rewatched some some stuff <laughs> it's interesting how like the thing that really really uh threw her over the edge was gwen's dad yeah i really wanted to talk about that i think do we want to save that for later i have that yeah, here, maybe. Um, later in the notes, but I 
was I remind I was reminded of that again earlier today actually as I was finishing up some notes that that was kind of one of the first things that turned her against Uther more firmly and I think that also speaks of her relationship to Gwen a little bit as well which we'll talk about a yeah. bit as well later so do we want to get more into I guess her parental relationships I guess starting off with her parents before she went to go live with Uther yeah is it stated like how old was she when her parents died or her parent I guess did I'm they did pretty the sure time, right or did they I'm I'm pretty sure she was 10 if I'm not mistaken I swear that's actually stated somewhere when somewhere around that age when she uh was I guess brought to Uther to be a ward in his household because her father uh, i don't know how to pronounce his name i really forgot gorlois gorlois i think it's gorlois kind of gorlois kind of um (laughs) as i would say in german that he died um interestingly enough because he didn't get the reinforcements that uther had promised to send him whether or not uther had sent them and they just didn't show up we don't know but Hmm. uther did claim that he was one of his best friends and yet you know cheated on like on his wife not cheat on his wife but he participated in an affair with vivian while gorlois was still alive because vivian had died before gorlois so yeah yeah such a good friend i know (laughs) friendship goals yeah but i think maybe that was part of why uther felt he had to take care of her i mean even if she wasn't like his actual daughter I feel like he would still have taken care of her because he felt guilty <laughs> about, you know, what he did to her dad, probably. I could see that. And Morgana does speak of her father. I think his resting place is somewhere near the Darkling Woods. It's obvious that she remembers him. and uh, But she never speaks about her mother, Vivian, which makes me question if she died when Morgana was very... Probably, because if... If Gorlois died when Morgana was 10, then Vivian, you know, probably died when she was very young. Yeah. Or the writers just didn't care to include anything yeah, like that. Yeah, that is a always, more likely option. always a possibility. We talked earlier about uh, Vivian and, like, the Great Purge, and if maybe she was killed because she was a sorcerer, but that isn't stated, so we don't really know. And also, like, when was Morgos born? Like, we don't actually know that. <laughs> Vivian, it's kind of because it's never stated that she really had magic, but it's kind of implied because more ghosts was supposed to be drowned because during the Great Purge, all the children. Okay, I'm not trying to get too much into the Great Purge right now, but all the children that might have inherited magic from their parents were supposed to be drowned, basically, and more ghosts was smuggled away. So it just confuses me the entire thing between Uther and Vivian when Uther probably knew she had magic. I yeah, guess it's confusing but you know what? Always, we'll maybe talk about that more yeah. later I guess we'll get back to that maybe but yeah Morgana never really knew her parents I guess because how much do you know your parents before the age of 10 not really <laughs> but she does I get like she would remember her dad which I think maybe would well sort of mean something I guess <laughs> I don't know how to phrase this it's okay i mean to to morgana she is effectively an orphan by the age of 10 or 11 or whatever when she comes into uther's care and that's the i guess the mentality or the the thought i don't know how to say this in english but that she that she brings with her that she you know has lost both her parents and uther is now this father figure this authority in her life but not her actual father despite the fact that he is her actual father which she will find out later yeah. Yeah, and I guess that would be like her losing her parents. I mean, that's a traumatic experience all on its own. Um, and maybe that was the first time that she sort of lost a sense of belonging or something like that. Because that's, I think that's like a common theme in Morgana's story is that she trusts people and then they end up like lying to her or using her in some way and she yeah she can't really trust them after that and I feel like maybe losing her parents 
at an early age was like the first instance of her losing her sort of sense of belonging in the world. Um, but then I guess she grew to accept Uther as a father figure, even though she also did oppose him to some degree, even at the beginning. <laughs> I think as well that there is this overarching theme of loneliness when it comes to Morgana. Yeah. That, you know, she loses her parents and she's lonely. She's, you know, well off with with Uther and surrounded by so many people, but still in a way she's lonely. When she finds out about her magic, she feels alone. When Merlin poisons her, she feels that there's no one left in Camelot that's really on her side. I just think there's a lot of loneliness in her life despite being surrounded by people I mean it's very yeah. easy to feel lonely regardless yeah definitely and I think it's very easy to compare her to Merlin and see that I mean because Merlin had Gaius to kind of guide him uh maybe he I mean maybe if he didn't have that maybe he would have ended up a different person and I think Morgana needed some kind of guidance that she didn't get uh, and that's one of the reasons why she ended up going down a different path, which we'll get to. And I guess this kind of flows into, if we speak about Uther, it kind of flows into this traumatic experience she had when she found out that Uther was her father. And we got this ask from an Anon that said, could you guys go into how Morgana would have developed lest they knew from the start that she was Uther's daughter? I presume the ending would be the same, but the reasons will be different. Thoughts? Yeah, I think because it's obvious from the start that she really um, disagrees with Uther's idea about magic being evil. And she thinks that the things he like, you know the whole purge thing isn't great and we get a sense that she really <laughs> doesn't like it <laughs> that he's killing sorcerers from the very start um and even if she knew that she was Uther's daughter she would eventually have found her own magic and that would have led her to I, I yeah I guess it would have been the same but I guess maybe one of the I don't know like it's Uther lying to her was definitely like one of the things that made I, th I think maybe it made her feel that she was more justified in hating him because he had lied to her because at that point he already like she already hated him at that point <laughs> so I don't know if it would have changed anything maybe I don't know if I can confidently speak to the fact that the ending would have been different. I think I would agree in the sense that it would have ended similar if everything else... Well, the thing is, everything else couldn't have folded the way that it does in the show if that were the case. But if things had unfolded similar. But I do agree that there would be a lot of things going on that would have been different throughout the show. I, Like you said, I think the fact that Uther didn't tell her and that she found out accidentally really speaks to the fact that uh, or I think for Morgana could come off as the fact that Uther was ashamed of her that he wouldn't tell anyone and in a way he was he was ashamed of what he had done to his best friend supposedly and he never admitted to anyone except for I guess I don't know did Gaius know already I don't before? actually know if we know. I don't think I don't think that's stated. I know Gaius knows about so Nimue and the Great Purge and Morgos and what happened there, but not about I'm not sure if he know he knew about the fact that Morgana was actually his daughter. That might have been Uther's best kept secret at that point. <laughs> yeah. I mean it would make sense for Gaius to know, but it would also make sense for him not to know. Like I don't I don't think that would have made a difference, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, the way Gaius treats Morgana, we're going to get into that as well, um, but it's very problematic. <laughs> it is. Do you, do you have anything else to say to what might have been different? I mean, obviously, Morgana and Arthur's relationship would have been different. Yeah, that's for sure. But I feel... 
I feel like they already acted kind of like siblings because they grew up together. Uh, but maybe if they knew that they were actually siblings, I feel like she would have been treated differently at court, maybe. If they knew that she was like a child of the king. Yeah, like Princess Morgana. Yeah. So maybe she, that would have changed their relationship. The fact that everyone else would have treated her differently. Um, but I feel like their relationship would have been kind of the same. Because in, in season one, I think they act like siblings. Even though for like one scene in like the first episode, it's like the show is like, what if they are in love? And you're just like, what? <laughs> I remember I had already, when I started watching this, I had already spoiled so many things for myself. So I was pretty sure that Morgana was a sister. And I was so confused when that was going on. I remember texting you like, Edith, what are they doing? Why are they implying this? Aren't they siblings? <laughs> and I was like, why do you know this? That's a spoiler. <laughs> But I really although, spoiled everything by season three. Yeah, if you know anything about like the author and legends, then you would probably know that, maybe. I mean, to be fair, they do have a child together because the original legend is like incest. Let's do it. Why why are all original legends like that? I yeah, don't this know. sounds good. I mean, to be fair, it was like very frowned upon in the legend as well. Um <laughs> But, you know, like, they didn't know they were siblings, so. <sighs> well, yeah, I have no more thoughts on this. <laughs> no, don't want to talk about it, actually. <laughs> Let's ignore it. Okay, so obviously finding out that Uther was her father was a traumatic experience for her. I guess we'll talk about this more when we get to more ghosts. But more ghosts does use that to her and Morgana's advantage. It was initially Morgos's idea to use her bloodline for the furthering of their mission, I guess, to overthrow Uther. Yeah. Yeah, because she does have, like, a legitimate claim to the throne <laughs> as his daughter, I guess. And if we continue on this vein of traumatic experiences, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the fact that she had to effectively grow up from whatever age she did join Uther's household, seeing these murders and injustices, much like we talked about Arthur seeing these things from, I mean, since a very young age, since he could remember. And uh, we, we hit on the fact that one of her first turning points was the murder of Gwen's father. Did you want to talk about that a little bit more or your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think because that is in season one, she starts having these dreams pretty early on um and she doesn't realize that they're magic at first she just you know she has these weird dreams and no one is explaining to her why these things are happening um i mean she's attacked with that bug in her ear in that episode i mean that must have been pretty scary for her um and you know a lot of things happen and it all just serves to sort of confuse her and also, Mordred, obviously, um, is something that would also leave a very, like, strong, I don't know, I feel, yeah, just saving Mordred and having to go through all of that. And then, I mean, Gwen is her best friend, as far as we know, because we never see any other friends of hers. And suddenly her, like, Gwen's father is killed by Uther. And at that point... Morgana already had these feelings of questioning Uther's morals and his ways. And this was just like the last straw, <laughs> I think, where she really flipped into hating Uther. I think that I agree with what you said, and I think that because Gwen was so dear to her, I mean, I know we didn't see a lot of Gwen's on-screen warning because they were allergic to showing us have yeah. Gwen Poss's traumatic experiences. But to see one of your best friends, one of your only friends, uh, suffer so much, I imagine just, I mean, didn't sit right with her. I can understand why 
sh- this hate that she had in her heart for Uther, Uther already a little bit had grew so much after that. Yeah, and I will say that, I mean, even though I think that was the last straw, she didn't have it in her to actually kill him at that point. Like, she was going to do it, but then she obviously, like, flunks out and doesn't do it. Um, Because I do think that it is very difficult to go against her father figure, obviously, even though she knows that he is a very bad person. And at that point, I think she has realized how bad he really is. Um, But then in season two, obviously, that kind of develops and... I think, is it, hmm. yeah, it's the other Mordred episode. When he comes back, that's when she, like, officially sort of says that she hates Uther. (laughs) Yeah, that's it, when Mordred just pops up again. I would say that's where she's kind of, not. I I wouldn't say dead set, but she's definitely more set on this path to overthrowing Uther, because she is in cahoots with Morgos at that point as well, so. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also everything that happens to her, I think every choice that she makes in the first two seasons are kind of justifiable. Like, I don't feel like she does anything in season one and two that are necessarily immoral. Like, I think she is acting kind of reasonably (laughs) considering what has happened to her. I would think so, too. I mean, even her reaction to wanting to kill Arthur, or not Arthur, Uther, Arthur's later, (laughs) her reaction to wanting to kill Uther. I mean, Arthur kind of had the same type of reaction when he found out and then later, I guess, unfound out about his mom. But she, you know, she's been hurt and she's angry. And at that point, I mean, besides that, you know, attempt on Uther's life, which honestly, who didn't want Uther to die? <laughs> yeah. She, I would agree, she was acting pretty reasonable in accordance to the moral compass that we see her have in the beginning. Yeah, and I think up until the season finale, even of season two, you can really see the hesitance in her. Like, she isn't evil she's just doing these things because she thinks it's what she has to do because Uther like he is a very bad person and he's not a good king and he has done some pretty bad things in his life and maybe it's not like he should be overthrown I think (laughs) in my opinion um and I think even in the season two finale before Merlin poisons her you can really see that she is like she's not sure about this like she doesn't want all of these people to be caught in the crossfire she just wants things to you know like magic to come back and for Uther to pay for what he's done she's not necessarily evil she's just been convinced that this is what she has to do for all of those things to happen and since we're talking about Merlin poisoning her I think we can get into the relationships that she has specifically with certain people and start out with Merlin because while I believe that Merlin poisoning her wasn't the thing that broke her and sent her off because at that point she was well already on that path I think it did again show her that one of the people that she thought was on her side or thought was her friend was so willing to betray her not only betray her but to kill her if need be yeah I definitely think because at that point before he poisoned her I think they were friends um and I don't think that she wanted Merlin to get hurt but I don't think that she expected him to turn on her because I think since she was so convinced that what she was doing was right and to some extent it was um I think I think Merlin poisoning her was just her realizing that maybe her place wasn't in Camelot anymore and the people on her side weren't necessarily there. Because I think it's like we talked about in the Arthur episode about his relationship to Merlin, where 
we talked about that he hadn't necessarily proven like we can all have different opinions on what Arthur would have done if Merlin had revealed his magic earlier but I think it's reasonable of him not to have done it because Arthur hasn't hasn't necessarily proven to him that he wouldn't act irrationally and I think it's the same thing with Morgana that she has seen him do his father's bidding all their lives and so I think maybe at that point because she believes that Uther is evil she doesn't expect Arthur to be on her side and when Merlin poisons her she knows that Merlin isn't on her side anymore um and at that point I mean it's basically just Gwen left (laughs) it is and I do have a question for you do you think it would have changed anything if Merlin had told her that he had magic in, in regards to her leaving and having this huge change in character and everything, do you think it would have changed any of that? You know what? I don't know. I think it might have, but it could, like, it might just as well have just not worked. Because I think they would still have different opinions on what to do in that situation. But I think maybe, like, it depends because if they had, like, a good communication and actually talked to each other and made a plan together, like, maybe then it could have worked. But I don't think they would have done that necessarily. And so I think Morgana would have still become way more radicalized, I guess. And Merlin would have stayed on this path that the dragon tells him to. <laughs> I would definitely agree with that. I don't think it would have changed her eventually leaving with Morgos because Morgos was still around and Morgana still believed the things that her sister said. And I feel if anything, it would have just put Merlin in direct danger that because Morgana would have known from the start that Merlin was Emery's, or at least that Merlin had magic. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's hard to say because the way the writers wrote Morgana in the end, I think she would definitely have just like killed Merlin. Um because she Or she would have told Arthur and just <laughs> yeah, messed up she, Merlin's life. She might have done that. Um I don't know actually. I think I, I still think he should have told her. I st- I still think that is a thing he could have done to help her and I think maybe that's what he should have done but I also get why he didn't yeah and I guess I'll hit on this a little bit more when we talk about Gaius but I think where they went wrong is maybe not necessarily that Merlin didn't reveal his magic right away but the fact that he denied her magic if that makes sense yeah that they basically isolated her because he didn't have to tell her right away if he didn't want to but I feel like they pushed her into this corner of being alone and telling her no you don't have magic that's ridiculous yeah and since her arc is so much about loneliness I think a thing she really needed was to feel like someone understood her and I think that was pretty much why it was so easy for Mogos to get her on her side because she didn't have anyone else who could listen to her and who actually knew about her magic and yeah, who didn't try to lie to her and say that it was nothing. So I think if Merlin had tried to talk to her and sort of validate her feelings, that could have gone a long way. I'm not sure if it would have helped in the end, but it could have. Like, he could have tried. (laughs) Yeah, some things with Morgana, I'm like, Merlin could have tried a little harder. I'm not saying it would have made things that much better I don't know that but sometimes I really I was re-watching some episodes yesterday like the boy did not try all that hard sometimes yeah and I think I'm not going to put this all on Merlin because I think Gaius right. had a lot of responsibility in this uh as well right. because I think Arthur didn't know what was going on so he couldn't really I don't think that he ever meant to hurt Morgana um and I get Do you want to why... speak more on their relationship Arthur and Morgana. Yeah, I guess, like I said, I think she didn't really have, like, he hadn't done anything to prove to her that he was more loyal to her than to Ufa, necessarily. I think maybe Mordred, because he did kind of, like, I don't know. It's very 
hard to say, but I think Arthur has done a lot of stuff for his dad that go against what Morgana believes in. And I think it's reasonable of her to expect Arthur to take Uther's side. And that's why I don't think once she hated Uther, I don't think she could fully trust Arthur because to some extent she knew that he would take his father's side like he always had, you know? I will say That's true. that I really, really love Morgana and Arthur's relationship in season one. And I wish we had gotten more of that. I really wish we had gotten more of them. I wish we had gotten some type of actual acknowledged healthy sibling relationship. But, you know, the fact that they find out that they're siblings is one of the catalysts to Morgana's extreme radicalization, I guess. Um, well, the fact that she finds out that there's her father but yeah i think arthur it's interesting to think about how in the dark he was left about this because for all that he knew everything was fine until morgana suddenly overthrew the kingdom in season three he didn't know what was going on the entire time yeah he thought they were okay (laughs) oh my sweet summer child (laughs) he really i mean he really did and he loved Morgana and just I I mean I imagine how much that just broke him because Merlin had witnessed this going on for you know well for us episodes you know for a while um but Arthur it all happened in a split second yeah and I think there's no way for Arthur to like there was no way he could have known what she needed in season two like, there was no way. So I'm not blaming Arthur. I think he was just very oblivious to all of this. And I wish he hadn't been. But, you know, that was just the way it was. And that's why their relationship didn't work. I definitely think he played a role in, in what she became. But kind of an unknowing role. In the, in the sense that he obviously, like you said, he couldn't have done anything different because he didn't know what was going on with her. Yeah, I, I will say he could have opposed his father more. Exactly. Um, he could have done something different out of his own, I guess, yes. character, but not in directly in regards to something affected by Yeah, because Morgana's that could have led position. to Morgana trusting him if she knew that he was capable of sort of opposing his father. But since he didn't really do that a lot, <laughs> I guess, you know... She just saw them as one and the same in the end, I think. And I think it's incredible how much hate she has for Arthur in the end. And I guess we'll kind of talk about the way that her relationships deteriorate. I think we have that later on. But that she goes from genuinely, you know, being she's sarcastic with him and annoyed with him, but being like a sister to him before she even knew that was true to absolutely wanting him dead just wanting him gone i think once morgana was so thoroughly radicalized i think she in her head i think she thought of uther and arthur as kind of the same person not the same person but they were like a symbol for the same problem and to her credit once arthur was king he didn't really do anything for magic users So it wasn't like she was wrong in thinking that he wouldn't really, you know, (laughs) sort things out. (laughs) So I think the reason why she sort of moved on from hating Uther to hating Arthur was just that they were sort of the cause. Both of them were the cause of the same sort of structure and system that she wanted to dismantle, I guess. I would agree with that. And I guess, do you have any more thoughts on Arthur before we move on to the wonderful Guinevere? I mean, I do love talking about Gwen. (laughs) Me too. And as we stated earlier, Gwen was one of her closest. uh, I wouldn't say her only friend, because obviously Arthur was her friend as well in Merlin, but definitely her closest friend. And we talked about how seeing her suffer after her father had been killed also was a catalyst to her change. Uh, But also some people wanted us to talk about their relationship a little bit more in detail. And Anon said, 
you should talk or do you want to read this one actually do you have the page open I mean, I can. So this anonymous listener said, uh, you should talk about how gay Morgana was for Gwen. Like there was something between them, definitely. I'm a lesbian. I know the lesbian gays. And also they uh, recommended this song called She by Dodie and saying we should listen to it while thinking about them, which I will say that I did. And I got really sad and I sat on my bedroom floor and I thought about it. So I thank you. Some other people sent us some song racks, and I was like, wow, I'm just getting emotional now. Yeah. And I guess, because oh, I, I do want to talk about Gwen and Morgana all day, but I will say this, that the only explanation that I could come up with for the change in their relationship once Morgana went evil is that by season two... Morgana knew that Gwen was in love with Arthur and I th- like the own the only plausible explanation why Morgana wouldn't trust Gwen is that she thought that she was more loyal to Arthur than to her and I think that's what the writers were on about <laughs> because if not that there is no reason for them not to be like for Morgana not to be to yeah treat Gwen as a friend that she trusts because they were literally best friends and then they just weren't (laughs) I mean Morgana not Morgana but Gwen was literally there for Morgana in her like during her roughest times she was the one that always came to Morgana when Morgana woke up screaming from nightmares and she was always she was just always so there for Morgana I mean honestly I do subscribe to the fact that if anything, at least Morgana was in love with Gwen, uh, even if Gwen wasn't with Morgana. But I mean, do you remember in season one when they were at that ball thing and Gwen was like, she's beautiful, isn't she? <laughs> Honestly, yeah, Gwen was like also in love with her. Just things went south. She picked the wrong pen dragon, and I will stand by that. She sure did. We could have had it all. We could have, but of course the show ruins it all for us, as usual. <laughs> and we're not getting too much into more Gwen, if you're wondering, because we are planning in the future to make a more Gwen episode. So we're not brushing over this question on purpose, just yeah, retaining and, and, our thoughts. And I will <laughs> say, because I am going to get into the problems with queer coding Morgana later, but in that episode, there will be no such discussion. There will just be me being gay and happy for them, okay? <laughs> More Gwen, the happy episode. Well, I want to say the happy episode, but it'll also be tragic. I mean, it will be sad because Merlin is a sad show. But, you know, um, I'm going to keep all the problematic discussion for this episode. And that episode, I'm going to try to be more chill because I just love them. As well as I am very upset about Morgana. (laughs) Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Do we want to talk a little bit about more ghosts? I know we talked about her already a bit, but do you have any extra thoughts? As Because as I said earlier, one of the things I think about is how much she influenced Morgana into this idea that she could use her bloodline to rule Camelot. Because, I mean, before that, Morgana was kind of just troubled by the new news and Morgos is like, this is great, overthrow Uther. And then Morgana's like, yes, that sounds like the best idea. I mean, it was a good plan because that was like a, you know, she has a kind of legitimate claim to the throne. So I guess use that. <laughs> but also, even though she <laughs> takes it by usurping, so I'm, yeah. I'm like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that happens. I mean, look at history. You know, that happens all the time. <laughs> because if she takes the throne like that, technically anyone could have done that one. Yeah. If she makes sure Uther and Arthur are both dead. Yeah, but I mean, like, if if they're both dead, then she's, I mean, she's the next Pendragon. So I guess, yeah, then she's rightful. If you have this sort of succession in a system, I guess she would have every right to be there. Well, anyway, I think her relationship to Morgos is very... I mean, I think it's reasonable that they become so close so quickly because at that point, Morgana doesn't really have anyone on her side. And like I said, like suddenly there's this person here who is family and who 
claims to want to help you and who knows about your situation. And I think anyone at that point would have been like, yes, please. <laughs> like, we have the same goal. Let's work together. I, I don't think it's weird that she went with Morgo so easily. I think it's very logical as well that that happened because, as you said, Morgos, Morgos also kind of had a way for for Morgana to, I guess not express, but to do something about the injustices that she's seen, to do something about what she felt was going wrong with Uther and with the kingdom and the wrongdoings against magic users. And Morgos kind of provided her with the means to, I guess in Morgana's eyes, try to make a change or do something different. And that just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. And then again, I mean, should we talk about this now? I don't know. Uh, I know a lot of people are like, why did they write them like incestuous? Why did they? I don't. Why is that just a theme? Yeah. And I have, I have an answer to that. But I'm going to take that whole thing once we talk about the queer coding. <laughs> okay, yeah. If you remember that, then we'll talk about that because that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess I don't have much more to say about more ghosts. I mean, I don't feel the need to get so much more detailed. I think, I think we kind of pinpointed the important parts of their relationship yeah. and the parts that more ghosts played. I'm sure we'll end up talking about more ghosts sometime in the future and other things because she just pops up when we talk about different topics sometimes. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but I really wanted to get into this Gaius situation. So yes. we had someone submit th us this ask, uh, incorrect TV gaze and more on Tumblr said, Ola, just want to say that your fan cast is what makes me so happy on days I feel down, which is, thank you, that's oh. that's so very nice. It's, well, warms my heart, really. I think Edith and I were, were really just freaking out about that one, because you guys are too kind. <laughs> but they continue to say, it would be interesting to discuss the ways in which Morgana was ill-treated by Gaius and everyone around her when talking about her prophetic dreams. Like Gaius, gaslighted her, and even when Merlin wanted to help, he didn't know how to do it properly. It made the situation worse. And then they wrecked us a song, a different, a different kind of human by Aurora, which I did listen to, and it, it made me really emotional. So thanks for that. I love Aurora. She's really good, actually. Yeah, she is. <laughs> like that. So, Gaius, gaslighting. Go. Oh, I don't like. I understand. This is one of those because I think Gaius, to some extent, was also a father figure to Morgana because they were really close when she grew up. Um, and I think this is one of those instances where a parental figure thinks they're doing the right thing. Like, I don't think that Gaius gaslighted her to be, like, to hurt her. I think he thought that she would be more hurt if she knew about her own magic, because then she could like potentially go to Uther and be like, well, stop killing magicians. I don't know. Sorcerers. <laughs> Back, you and your magicians. I know, mean my magicians. Um, yeah, I mean, she could have potentially gone to Uther and been like, I have magic. Are you going to kill me? And then maybe he would have. Like, we don't know. We just don't know. Uther is crazy. So maybe Gaius thought that it was for her own good that she didn't know. And I think it was bad of him to do that like he shouldn't have lied to her that was definitely a bad thing to do but I don't think he did it out of malice I think he did it out of love but you know sometimes parents do bad things to their children without realizing I could agree with that because as much as I have a lot of problems with Gaius and he gives honestly sometimes the worst advice in the world. He, I never got the sense that he was trying to, like you said, act in a malicious way. I just think that the, the advice he gives is honest to goodness, just terrible most of the time. <laughs> just yeah. bad. I mean, we see, we see times where it does work out and, you know, obviously those moments then exist, but 
we see times where it really just mostly in, in if we're talking about in regards to Merlin just makes things kind of worse yeah and I think he like all of Gaius's advice comes from a place of wanting to help so I don't think that he I mean he definitely doesn't want things to go wrong he wants things to go good for his children he doesn't have children but like let's be real he has children um (laughs) found family guys wow found family gone tragic oh i don't like that um yeah i the way he treats her because i think in season one their relationship is so good and i think he really is like a very important person to her and he has been for like her entire childhood. So the fact that he would lie to her, I mean, it's just another trauma, really. <laughs> it's just another point of her realizing that she really is alone, that she doesn't have anyone on her side, because even Gaius would lie to her. I agree with that. And I would say as well, like I said earlier, I really don't like the fact that they just left her alone, that they kind of isolated her and would just make her feel like what she has is a bad thing. The fact that she has magic is bad. And the fact that they didn't support her in some way through that and kind of lied to her about everything. Again, I don't think Merlin necessarily needed to, needed to say anything about his magic. Would it maybe be nice? Maybe not. I don't know. But the fact that they kind of just left her alone is what makes this situation so terrible for me. Yeah. And I think because... The difference between Merlin and Morgana is, I mean, many things, but one of the differences uh, is that Merlin already knew he had magic. And at the start of the show, he already knows that he is valid for having magic and he is already very annoyed with the system at place. Uh, And he has these little rants where he's like, why should I have to hide who I am? Um, but Morgana, since no one's ever talked to her about this, she doesn't really like she doesn't know anything about her magic. And so it's obvious that she is just very lost. Uh, and she would have needed someone to, you know, tell her it was okay. Yeah. We we wish Morgana got someone like that that wasn't Morgos. <laughs> <sighs> Do we wanna move on and talk about Mordred and then we'll get to, I guess, her big shift in character that a lot of people wanted us to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i always up for talking about Mordred. You know me. <laughs> I love of that course, guy. Our, our resident Mordred stan. I do love Mordred. I was rewatching season five with a friend because she had just finished the show and was mad at me because she didn't know that it ended tragically. <laughs> but... <laughs> Mordred did deserve better but yeah I think she because we see throughout the show that she's very I'm not sure if this is the right word but she's very kind of obsessed with Mordred with his well-being and everything I really think that she finds this kindred spirit in Mordred and even later you know when in season five Mordred betrays her and she feels that betrayal very deeply but when he comes back she immediately accept, accepts him yeah I think because Mordred showed up in the show right as she was starting to have these dreams and right as she was starting to show signs of having magic and I think at that point she didn't really know what was happening to her but maybe she still had an inkling that she was different and then suddenly this vulnerable child shows up and she maybe subconsciously I think felt that they were the same to some extent. And I think maybe, as well as the fact that she was just a good person trying to help a child, I think maybe she saw him as someone like her and that she had to help him because if she could help him, then maybe there was also like hope for her. I think that was definitely like a symbolic thing for her as well. And obviously when he shows up again, that is when she really takes a turn um and realizes that Uther you know isn't isn't great and I think their relationship is very because I sort of went back to 
the Mordred episodes in season one and two. And I think the time he shows up in season two, it's kind of strange because at that point, Mordred is still a child. And I think that you could argue that he is being used by other people to like further their schemes and that Mordred isn't like he obviously he isn't evil because he's a child and I think that Morgana sees this so I'm not sure like because I read the sort of summary of that second Mordred episode and it's almost like the person who wrote it was like Mordred had this scary plan and I'm like he was a child (laughs) he didn't know what he was doing (laughs) I mean, he was very young at that point. Yeah. So I, I always feel like Morgana kind of feels like a mother figure to Mordred in a way. Yeah, the I definitely. Way that she kind of just cares about him. And then, I mean, in the original legend, she was her. Mother. She... <laughs> so you know, <laughs> it 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 do do be fitting. Yeah. Oh. All right. If we have nothing else for relationships, I wanted to read this. Um, commentary that I had made some post about Morgana and Gwen a couple of weeks ago and uh, a blog on Tumblr called and damn the consequences. She's amazing. You guys should go follow her Uh, kind of, she does a lot of sometimes like I would kind of meta post on things that are really interesting. And I think this, what she said in response to Morgana's character development here kind of really ties up nicely what we've said already and leads nicely into, um, I guess, what Morgana became. So I'll just read some of that right now. Cool. She said, Merlin telling her wouldn't change what's already been done. She left with Morgos because she'd felt alone and hurt since the age of 10. And Morgos was some form of family. Bearing in mind, she believes her whole family to be dead. That doesn't make her feel that way. Her loneliness didn't start with her magic. It started when Uther killed people and she didn't agree with, um, with him, which, which was for years. Merlin telling her he has magic isn't going to erase that. And then kind of a closing point here. Uh, Merlin did not create what she became. Uther did that. Arthur did that. Merlin held, but she was not his unfortunate little mistake. And I guess that kind of, I think we had a lot of the similar points throughout that. That kind of sums up, I guess, the, the tragedies that Morgana has seen from a very young age. And kind of what catapults her into this direction. Yeah, and I think definitely, like, if Merlin hadn't been in the show at all, I think Morgana's arc would maybe have looked the same. I think Merlin wasn't... I Because that's, that's not the problem I have with Merlin. It's not that he did something to really throw her over the edge. It's that he didn't do enough to keep her from going that far. I think what I'm most upset about with the relationship between Morgana and Merlin is that he didn't do enough. I don't think that he was the reason that she went bad, so to say. Yeah. And again, I think because I kind of have that same problem and that's still not to say that that would have prevented things, but just the fact that in my opinion, he sometimes didn't try to do enough, but he also had a lot of things going on. Yeah. So, I mean, whatever. that's because you can always sit like, I'm sure I've done things in my life where I could have solved things if I had just done things earlier, like stuff like that happens. We all do bad things without realizing it. So I'm not saying Madden is a bad person, but I'm saying if there is one person who could have changed the way things went with her, maybe it was him. But then again, like, I don't want to put too much on his plate because he was I mean he was busy (laughs) yeah and I mean you kind of uh pointed to this earlier but I mean he honestly was more loyal to Arthur yeah either way so had Morgana deviated enough even after all that he would have stuck by Arthur definitely and I think she knew that so shall we talk about the dreaded time skip (laughs) Yes, do you want to read this ask that someone sent us because it kind of goes really well into, I guess, this first thing, this first theme of what even happened 
while yeah. she was gone. So we got this ask from Silver Dagger 865 uh, and they said, Hey, super excited for your Morgana themed app. Uh, one thing I definitely think would be interesting is a discussion slash mention of what specifically happened to her to turn her so evil while with Morgos for that one year away from Camelot. Uh, her switch always seemed so dramatic to me, so it would be cool to hear your takes on it. Keep up the <laughs> awesome work, lovelies, and then two little heart emojis. Oh, so sweet. So cute. We have the best listeners. Yes, this, we do. We really do. I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, this dramatic change, because when she leaves, I mean, she had just been poisoned, but, you know, she was still, I don't know how to how to describe it, but, you know it kind of felt like her views weren't completely cemented. And when she comes back, she's just cartoon villain Morgana. (laughs) Yeah, it's... I will say this, though, that the more I think about it, the more I think that it's not that the skip is unbelievable. It's more that it's unsatisfying. Because we don't know what happened. Yeah, because... A year is a very long time. And I think that she, at that point, enough had happened for her to be radicalized to like a very strong degree. And I think a year is definitely enough time for her to sort of find new alliances and realize that Camelot is not, like she doesn't really have allies there anymore. So I think that is to some extent believable but it's very unsatisfying for that entire development to be off screen yeah because the question then becomes okay what how did she reach that point did did more ghosts you know just kind of doctrinate her into all of this by being the very supportive sister. Some people kind of speculate did more ghosts torture her, but I I don't think that's very like more ghosts. Not what we've seen of more ghosts. It seems like more ghosts would more than anything just mentor her into this and be by her side as Morgana, you know, fights back against Uther and his tyranny. Yeah, and I think part of me is like because what makes sense for more ghosts to have done is to give Morgana you know, the family she didn't feel like she had and support her. And I mean, convince, she probably convinced her that Arthur was just as bad as Uther at some point because, you know, she didn't think that in season two. Um, And I think, yeah, I I think the most reasonable thing for for Mogos to have done is to just show her that magic isn't bad. And I know that I talked about this last episode where I just think that I think maybe this is why it happened off screen because if we had gotten these scenes of Morgos like I mean maybe showing Morgana sorceress in hiding maybe showing her everything that Uther had done to ruin things maybe we would have rooted for Morgana (laughs) I think some of us did root for Morgana (laughs) to a certain degree most of us yeah um, I think up until the point where she just turned full cartoon villain, I think Morgana is probably the most sympathy inducing. Like, I think I really feel for her, which is why I think she makes a really good villain up until the point where she's just completely unreasonable and completely ruthless. I think my biggest problem is it's not the motivation because that for me makes sense. And like you said, it's not the time skip in and of itself, because a lot can happen in that time. I think one of the problems I have, because Morgana had so much potential, more potential as a villain. uh, The problem that I have is that it seems like all of her relationships just go forgotten. And not in that she's suppressing these feelings so that she can go on, because that would have made this interesting. No, in that she just has an utter hatred for these people she used to love. With no explanation. Yeah. I guess like you can you can, you know, make your explanation and it would make sense in theory, but just the way that it all played out is very strange. Yeah, I feel like I mean, especially with with Gwen, I think. Um I mean, because Morgana does give her a chance to stay with her once she takes over and be like, you can still like I still want you here if you want to be here. But it's clear that she doesn't really trust her anymore. 
And I think maybe to see Morgana the least bit torn up about that would have been great. Because after that, it's kind of all about killing Gwen. <laughs> it's yeah. get, get Gwen to kill people or kill Gwen, make sure Gwen's not queen, you know, even if... I mean, she literally tells Uther that things are going on between Gwen and Arthur so that, you know, she can get rid of Gwen. Yeah. She and just I, yeah, I think... doesn't care about Gwen. I mean, I guess that was before obviously the you can still stay, but which is kind of funny. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And I think that you can still stay, like it could have been that that could have been such a moment. That could have been like the last bit of humanity in Morgana being like, I really like I miss you as my friend and I really want you here. But instead it just came off as insincere. And like, I don't actually trust you. And I know you will go back to Arthur. <laughs> because I remember that scene so clearly, even though I didn't watch it when I was reviewing episodes, but she still has that like evil smile to her. Like, oh, when everything goes down, you can still stay. But she's like super, I don't know, weird about it. There's no like tenderness or like, I don't know. There's, there's just nothing. But, you know, you can see that in her eyes. She has this plan and, you know, it's about to happen. Yeah. She's about to go through with it. Yeah, and I think even in a uh, what's essentially a kids' show, um, it's very like a character being this black and white, just out of the blue, because she used to be very deep and very complex. But then to suddenly have her be this, you know, just evil, unhinged villain, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> it doesn't, and. You know, we see one spark of sympathy. I saw a gift for this the other day in one of the episode five episodes, or episode five, well, season five episodes, where Morgana brainwashes Gwen, because we know that's our favorite pastime in the show, brainwashing Gwen. And they they hug in like the middle of these dark woods when Gwen's brainwashed. And Morgana for a second looks so like you can see in her face. I don't know that like she's missed Gwen or she's missed this or something has happened. It's it's like this weird spark of like the writers gave her gave us a glimpse of you know the sympathy the questioning we could have had and then just dashed that immediately you know yeah. we can't include that part of me is like I'm not gonna give this to the writers because it's not a line it's just like a look so I'm gonna be like Katie thank you I guess you gave us something <laughs> true Katie McGrath said. Morgana writes, Gwen writes. Love her. For a second. (sighs) Yeah. I mean, I don't... I think it's just a lot of speculation when it comes to this skip because we just... We don't know what happened. Yeah. Uh, We we, we wish for someone that... Or a villain that had these moments of second guessing. These moments of, you know, I I once loved these people. Even... Especially with Arthur as well. At least a moment where she hesitates in killing Arthur. But no, it's all about just he needs to be dead. Yeah. And this kind of plays into my problems with Morgana as well. uh, With her being, you know, a female villain and queer coded. And she lives in a hut in the woods and she doesn't brush her hair. Um, All of that kind of plays into this very stereotypical female figure and I'm I have a lot of feelings about it (laughs) do you want to talk about that now we can do the miscellaneous stuff at the end I mean that would make sense anyway should we we're talking about it yeah should we just skip over the fun things and do the tough things now and then do the fun things later maybe (laughs) we can do that you can lead us on this one I can tell you have a lot to say I'll yeah I'll give my commentary as as I see fit. Yeah, so maybe I should start by saying that I don't know if you've seen this 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 tweet uh that I don't I don't remember how it's exactly phrased, but it's something like when you see a really like evil female queer coded villain and one part of you is like that's bad and the other part of you is like that's hot. Um and you know what? I'm I'm not immune. <laughs> to sexy evil female villains um so I will say that part of me is like I love Morgana the way she is she's evil and unhinged and I wish I could be that but I will also say 
um, that it's a very problematic and old stereotype uh, that women who reject societal expectations are inherently evil and unhinged. And I don't like that. (laughs) It does paint this whole situation in a way, because, I mean, at the beginning as well, Morgana does start off, because what she's fighting for, if you strip that down to its bare bones, what she's fighting for is a noble cause. She's, in a sense, kind of like um, Kara said in episode 11, um, fighting for her freedom to be who she is. But the way that it's painted and the way that it's all betrayed and the extreme the extremism that she goes to the lengths that she goes to i think i don't know would just if you you know have this character who is queer coded uh is just harmful i would agree with that yeah and i think that's portrayed yeah that definitely because i back to this whole thing but i i'm so i don't understand what the writers were trying to say with this show because they start out being like magic is fine and people who have magic aren't evil and then everyone who has magic is evil and the more Morgana fights for this cause that is inherently like it's a just cause it's perfectly understandable why she wants to overthrow Uther and bring back magic but still she turns out to be this you know just unhinged hag who lives in the woods and it's yeah it's very i just this entire show is just very soaked in misogyny and every female character is either good or evil because they refuse to like obey the structure of society and i think the queer coding definitely falls into that and i think the fact that morgana is very clearly portrayed not to have any interest in men really is definitely like part of this rejection of what it means to be a woman and the fact that she just that she's an evil person and doing these things it's mm, it's not great it's not very good (laughs) it's not and to i guess to speak on the length she's gone to uh when you were talking about this just a little bit ago it's she goes beyond, you know, kind of this idea of casualty of war for a cause because she starts putting innocents in danger that have really little to do with what she's fighting for. I mean, when she takes over Camelot for the first time, she literally has the firing squad point their arrows on a group of people. And yeah. she, you know, threatens to have them shot if the guards, or not the guards, but if the knights don't, you know, pledge loyalty to her. And we see in season five, she has, um, in episode 12, she has this guy's magic taken away in a very painful manner. You know, he just is without the thing, you know, that I'm sure is a huge part of him, um, just so she could test out if this, or to demonstrate more than anything, that this would work on Emery's as well. Yeah. So she just becomes really callous, not only to people against her cause, but to people even within her own cause. Yeah, and I think that's also because when she starts doing these things like killing innocent people and putting people at risk just because like the end justifies the means, I think that's when she loses our sympathy as viewers. But I also think that's where a lot of us find her development kind of jarring and that something doesn't really sit right. And I think because it just doesn't make sense that she would suddenly turn into this black and white I'm just evil now. Um, And I think that it's because it just falls into this very stereotypical, old-fashioned way of viewing women that it's like you're either like a pure virgin or you're a woman or you're like a hysterical hag. And once she's crossed the border and she's like, oh, I'm like, I'm not interested in what men think about me and I want to overthrow the system, then she suddenly evil and the thing is that like in the in modern society and with all of these like social justice struggles it's very easy to sympathize with Morgana up until the point where she tries to you know start killing innocent people so it's very I I'm just very confused about what they want us to think about her and I think you know the fact where 
I find myself being like, yeah, but she's a very sexy villain. (laughs) Haha, I still love her. (laughs) I mean, that's, I feel bad about thinking that because it feels very much like, not to get too political, but parts of like liberal feminism where it's like, oh, girl boss culture and we need more powerful women, even if they're serial killers. And like, that's not, (laughs) that's not good. (laughs) Yeah, that's not a good image to have. <laughs> no, so it's like, I'm like, can we please just... Oh. Yeah, basically, the idea that a woman who doesn't subscribe to societal norms is inherently evil is just bad. And the fact that she's also heavily queer-coded just makes it so much worse. And that is my main issue with Morgana as a character. Because in the beginning, I really do love her. And I think... I think I I still do love her as a character because I think the way that fandom portrays her and the way that I think of her in my mind, she's a different character than what she turns out to be in the show because what she turns out to be in the end in the show is not a character that I can subscribe to because I think she represents too much badness. Yeah, and thank you for that. I mean, no, it was it was genuinely very interesting um, because I guess I hadn't reflected on some of those things so much. So genuinely, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just a little a little gay woman <laughs> with a very very complicated relationship to womanhood, and you know, I want to expand. A little, you're you're seven <laughs> foot tall, Edith. Come on. This is, uh, we have a running joke in our group chat for everyone listening that I'm very tall because everyone who hasn't met me is like, she's very tall. She has tall energy. I do not have tall energy. I'm short. We'll see. We'll see when I do show up to Sweden and you are seven foot tall. Then I'll know for sure. I am. And I want this on record. 165 centimeters tall. I will say. Shorter than George. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Short King is 170. I'm 172. Got him beat by two. Yeah, you see, I'm shorter than George. I'm not tall. <laughs> I'm not like really super short. I'm just not tall. Anyway, this is a good segue. Well, good segue. <laughs> it is. To go from the, <laughs> the heavy stuff to the miscellaneous. <laughs> we have some. All right, let's do this. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that we were going to do this maybe a little bit more rapid fire around questioning. Yeah, um, these are just some thoughts about Morgana, I guess, that we don't get answers to in the show. I guess the first one would be, is Morgana older or younger than Arthur? And this, when we started planning this podcast, in my head, I was like, who cares? I've realized people do care. So let's talk about it. (laughs) Yeah, people really do care. And once in future gay on Tumblr uh, was the one that suggested this one to me. But I had always subscribed to the idea that Morgana was younger. I found out today that I am actually in the minority on this idea, even though I feel like, well, I was pretty confident I was correct until like minutes before the podcast. I still don't think she's older really, but I think the writers just don't even know. But my evidence for younger would be, I found um, this like old transcript. So it's not in the transcript you would find if you looked up the episode one transcript, but they described at some point Morgana to be the same age as Merlin. I'm not sure because it's not in the in the last transcript, the last version, if that still stands. But I guess that would be one. Also, it would make sense if Uther had this affair with Vivian after Egraine had died. I think, I mean, as as terrible as Uther is, it would still make more sense in the I loved Egraine department than if he had cheated on her with Vivian before. Um, and yeah, some of the timeline things don't add up, but... Did you have something to add to that before I go on, Edith? I mean, I just always thought that she was older because I think she has older sibling vibes. But that's literally as far as my explanation goes. <laughs> the vibes. Yeah. Check. And then I was like, yeah, but then it makes sense that she thinks she has the right to the throne. But I realized that that doesn't really matter to her at that point. So it doesn't like, I don't know. She could be either older or younger. At this point, I'm not like, I don't know. I guess younger makes sense, actually. Like, I can I can see Uther having an affair with Vivian because he's, like, struck by grief and Golois is gone to the war. <laughs> like, that makes sense to me in my head. So from Uther's, like, thinking of Uther, 
I think it makes more sense if Morgana was all younger. But in my head before this, I'd always thought that she was older and I think it was just a vibe. <laughs> just the vibe check. Yeah, I will say not that Merlin Wiki is the end all be all of things, but that also said um, she was younger. And yeah, there's some complications where you get into when did Vivian die? Okay, if Morgosa was supposed to be drowned, I think I mentioned this earlier, then did Uther know Vivian had magic? Then why would he have this affair with her? If you know, the younger thing. But then on the other end of the spectrum, it's like, why would he cheat on Igraine if supposedly this is the love of his life? Blah, blah, blah. So I guess we'll just never know officially, officially, unless, you know, we can get it out of one of the writers, which will never happen. So I don't think they know. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if the writers didn't actually have an official timeline because a lot of things... I just, I'm so confused by why they don't because that would have made so much sense to just have a timeline of the events before the show so that you know what has happened (laughs) because then when they bring up things I'm just like yeah okay but when did this happen and how does that relate to everything else that you said happened before the show started I just want to know more that would be too useful true (laughs) too too much effort (laughs) all right did you want to say a comment anything about i guess we'll combine this costumes or the bogwitch lesbian aesthetic you kind of talked on that a little bit i mean i did now but uh because i do have two opinions like i'm very conflicted about it because i do i love the idea of women just not giving a crap (laughs) about societal expectations and just like I'm gonna live in a bog my hair is gonna look like a crow's nest and it's fine because I'm doing what I want to do and I think that's great um if she wasn't evil that would be splendid (laughs) so yeah I I love the aesthetic I don't love what it implies (laughs) because like you never see a good woman looking like that because good women are always hot (laughs) i would have died to have like i don't know see i feel like gwen just like wouldn't fit into this as well which you know is another thing of like gwen you know looking the way she does because she's good and then morgana looking the way she does because she's evil but i would have like honestly paid big bucks to see morgana like good morgana dress like the bog witch vibes Mm, in season one yes (laughs) that would have been great Imagine Gwen and Morgana living in a little hut. <laughs> Imagine. Love that. No, but it's very I it's I would know. it's very like JK Rowling esque, where it's like, oh, this person is ugly, so they must be evil now. <laughs> it's like, okay, well thanks for that. Only huh? competent people are hot. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um no, but I, I really like I love Morgana's whole look. Um, I loved it in the earlier seasons as well. I I will say at some point I'm probably going to do a full episode on the costumes because I used to study textiles and some of the costumes in this show make my skin crawl. Mostly season one, I will say. Uh (laughs) You're going to just have this episode where Edith schools me on costuming and I just ask her questions. (laughs) Q&A episode if you will we'll see i'm sure i'll have things to say yeah and i will say because there's they never state what year this is supposed to take place so i'm not going to be like oh this is the wrong period of dress i mean it'd have to be after feudalism there's knights and stuff yeah yeah i just i don't know exactly what century it's supposed to be i mean yeah, when someone shows up in stilettos i'm gonna be like excuse me (laughs) <laughs> Nimue, Hello. not Nimue. Nimue, you live in a cave. <laughs> she said, I'm a stunt on them while I take their life with a couple life. Thank you. Yeah. Also, the dress Morgana wears in the first episode when she's like, let's give the boys something to look at. It's so ugly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um former textile study student Edith popping out right now. So I mean, I did drop that degree, so maybe I don't have a right to (laughs) go off. I was set to be a costume designer, guys, but not anymore. Well, well, they heard you. They heard you talking bad about BBC Merlin. Yeah. They were like, let's make her life miserable. (laughs) Two two more very serious questions, then we'll close this out. Um, 
what does Morgana think of Arthur, aka Lancelot Camelot's singing career? <sighs> I mean, I'm just like, because he wouldn't tell her, I don't think. But I think she would find out because she is smart. Um, and I think maybe she would hear rumours that he was singing a song about how she's annoying. And she would be like, who have I wronged? <laughs> and then she would like, I don't know, sneak to the tavern in her, you know, good old velvet cloak that she always wears yeah, when she's out doing mischief. Side point, but I really want that cloak. Um and then she would just, you know, follow him home and find out it's Arthur. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> Why is he going to the castle? <laughs> and then she would, like, laugh for a full week. <laughs> oh, she'd make fun of him. Yeah. It'd be so funny. Um, but I think she awesome. would I think she would support him in the end. Of course. Gotta support his singing career. Yeah. But make he the, definitely... whatever the equivalent of the medieval charts is. Yeah. But I mean, they're still siblings, so she would definitely bully him about it. <laughs> of course. No doubt. <laughs> Endless teasing. And... Definitely. And we have, finally, did she train with Arthur? So, like, her swordsmanship, kind of, where did that come from? I know I talked, of, or I brought up the point that, like, I wonder if Gorlois had any part in that, but I'm sure she really just did some training with Arthur at some points, which would have been iconic to see little young flashbacks. Yeah, I mean, if because considering Morgana was... I th Was she Goloi's only child? Do we know that? That he... Well, Morgos too, but yeah. Morgos disappeared. Yeah, since, basically. I mean, Morgos wasn't in the picture, I guess that Morgana would have been... Maybe it's his only child. Yeah. His only child, and then it would have made sense because even in medieval times, if someone had just a daughter, which is like in itself, what, what do you mean, just a daughter? Uh, <laughs> but like they they could still train and do stuff when they're young, even though they're not able to become knights and stuff. She would have been able to train with him, I think. So maybe she had some experience with fighting before she came to Camelot. And then I think, I mean, I would like to think that she sparred with Arthur sometimes. Didn't she make a comment in the moment of truth that like she had beat him before? I think like she, in I like they informally so. sparred together, I'm sure. Yeah. I just mm, love that. <laughs> I do. I love that too. Wish we, we, I wish we could have seen it. Yeah. Those I are iconic. Like the moment of truth. Ma iconic scenes her look in the moment of truth i don't care if it's historically inaccurate it's so good <laughs> her and gwen in that episode <laughs> me watching that as like an 11 year old not knowing that i wasn't straight <laughs> and i was like hello hello, <laughs> <Mail."> hello. <laughs> anyway love that for you love sword well, fighting Yes, I guess my my closing thoughts on this whole ordeal to make it so simple that it's not even like complex anymore. Um, I love Morgana. Hate what she became in the end, in the sense that we didn't. I, I feel like we kind of got like half a journey, and then at some point it all went off the deep end for no explainable reason. Yeah, yeah, I love her too. She's like one of my favorite characters. Of all time, I would say. She is... She's great. Yeah. I, I think about her a lot, and I, I do just love seeing her in episodes. Even even when she's evil. <laughs> even when she's evil. I sometimes just ignore some things, like, you know, we talked about earlier, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be like that. Well, this episode... I mean, I'm not sure how much I'll cut from this, but a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, which is funny because I remember telling Edith that uh, I didn't know what else I was going to say. Well, not that I didn't know, but I was like, uh, I'm not so confident. I have a lot to say. And here we are. <laughs> and I was like, it's fine. It's Morgana. I will have things to say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we did it. We did it. So for anyone who stuck around till the very end of I'm this so long proud. episode. Yes, first of all, thank you. Second, we've already decided that in two weeks, we will be dropping our, I'm sure, long-awaited Merther episode. 
And I'm sure it's going to be long. <laughs> oh, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to get cancelled. And we, we hope that you guys send in your thoughts and your opinions and your comments. I will... I can already tell you what our structure is kind of going to look like is good. So you'll rest assured. A lot of good things to say. If you don't like Merther, in fact, if you really don't like Merther, then maybe just tune in for the bad <laughs> because that's a section. And then the fix it. What what could have made this all so much better? But I mean, to make it clear, we both like Merther, so it's not like I we're going like, to go in just like is a strong word, Naomi. <laughs> Stop. I'm so ready for our good cop, bad cop <laughs> routine. Cop. <laughs> no, so like I'm bad cop, bad cop on the bad part. Don't yeah, even... I'm gonna play nice. I promise. <laughs> I have good opinions as well as bad. <laughs> anyway, it should be a very interesting episode, and I'm sure. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we'll get our first. Uh, I disagree with you. Comments, which would be cool, actually. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so make sure to send in questions if you have them. You can find us on Tumblr or our email address that I keep forgetting. <laughs> Mythsandmagicfancast at gmail.com. Yes. Or YouTube as well. YouTube comments. Um, I think a, a lot of our listeners are listing over Spotify or other things. At the beginning, it was a lot of people on YouTube, but now not so much. But if you are one of the ones listening on YouTube, then you can definitely leave your comment in the comment section below if you want to yeah we love hearing from you well then we hope that you enjoyed this episode and enjoyed us just going off about morgana because we love her and we only want the best for her and we hope that you have a great week yeah stay safe out there and have a good time <laughs> bye bye Thank you for listening to Myths and Magic, a Merlin fan cast. The intro and outro music are snippets from the song Now We Ride by Alexander Nakarada, accompanied by dialogue from BBC's Merlin. More information can be found in the description. We will be dropping new episodes of the podcast twice a month. We hope you'll join us again soon.